I'm working today on Stonehenge paper. This is actually stretched over a panel. So I have kind of a hard backing behind this, but I also have that firm kind of taut nature that, um, that a stretched paper will have. I've also toned it with a little bit of ink. Um, I used uh, obviously like a permanent India ink that is black, but also I, I added a little bit of um, white into it because I wanted somewhat of a kind of a, a chalky, kind of grayish feeling to the, um, to the surface. I've, I've wet this surface a number of times now, and so probably the fibers of the paper and the size of the paper have kind of opened up a little bit. So I think that I'll have uh, a really nice surface to kind of get some good graphite into. I'm thinking that um, eventually because she has this kind of dark hair that I'm going to have to push values a little bit further maybe than I normally would and I'm even considering the idea that I might paint some of the graphite into the hair just so I can get a broad rich kind of dark you know rhythmic um, pattern of hair um, you know going across her head and behind her shoulders and out on the other side. Um, the, the paper itself, like I said, is, uh, is, is Stonehenge and it's something that I'm growing really increasingly comfortable with. I'm, I'm doing less and less uh, an experimentation with other papers and, um, and, and really more kind of sticking to this one. And uh, hopefully, you know, what I'm able to get at the end of this is a really nice kind of finished piece. Um, I'm looking for something compositionally that is going to actually touch um, the bottom of the canvas through here. I want to do really a kind of portrait that shows um, the entirety of what's there. A lot of times I'll kind of uh, create a cropping that is a little bit of like a kind of a floating head type of sense where the, um, the portrait itself is like unmoored to uh, say the shoulders or, or anything that's really going to extend out to the edges of the canvas. And in this one I got the sense that I want a little bit more of a kind of an intimate feeling. I want um, more of a you're sitting or standing in the room with the model kind of feeling. And I think for that sense, uh, kind of creating a picture that represents maybe the whole body such as it is, um, is useful to kind of convey that. The frontal lighting that's on the model, I think, is going to be really kind of conducive to showing this kind of form of the head. We have a very kind of soft turning side plane of a face um, uh, and this is caused by the fact she has really rounded features. Guys and older guys in particular will have like really kind of chiseled features so that you'll be uh, drawing these really kind of harsh kind of breaks in between the front plane of the face and the side plane of the face. I find that with the model here um, that I've actually got uh, a really kind of soft turn in that sense and I also want to kind of, um, I want to respect that in the sense that I don't want to kind of overdo the kind of harshness of any of the transitions. I really want to get a feeling that, um, uh, that we have the same kind of soft roundness to her head that, um, that she has in reality. Uh, also, since she's looking to the left, I'm going to be uh, probably skewing the portrait a little bit left. Um, uh, or a little bit right, rather, on the canvas. So I want to make sure that I have like a little bit more distance on this left-hand side. Um, it doesn't have to be a lot, but just enough that kind of we get a sense that she's um, looking off in this direction. She has a little bit of room to kind of look off in that direction. A lot of times, like in this early stage of the drawing, a lot of the marks that I'm making I'm using them to kind of position the model in a sense. So um, I'm trying to kind of organize a little bit the, the composition. I, I don't have so much at this moment like a set of measurements in mind. It's more that I have uh, a location or a position in my head within this square that I think <clears throat> that I think will kind of fit the model quite well and fit the pose quite well. Ultimately we can probably think about breadth in terms of a kind of soft approach to drawing. Um, in that, uh, when you're drawing, you're making these lines, these marks on your paper, 
um, inevitably there is a kind of sharpness that, that I think wants to emanate out from, from that process of mark making. Um, if we are to maintain breadth in our drawing, what that will mean is at the very least a mixture in between the sharpness and softness that you're rendering with and in its most uh, writ large kind of sense um, breadth ultimately would be a very soft and a very open drawing that only maybe in the last moments um, became something that was uh, tightened up or, or made uh, rigid and, and clear. Um, the balance, of course, to create uh, out of that becomes very difficult because when you are treating a drawing with a lot of softness, there is a risk that it be can become uh, quite non-specific, right? Or it can become quite generic is actually the language that is, is used most commonly about it. Which, by the way, when I was a student, the first time I had a teacher that referred to my drawing as generic, I was absolutely mortified. Um, not understanding, of course, that to call a drawing generic is really just to say that it is an alternative to specificity. Um, but of course, you know, if someone outside of the world of, of drawing and academia calls you generic, um, it's a far more biting criticism than. Uh, than say what it is in um, the world of drawing and painting. Um, so you want to be soft, but you want to be specific. And this is the, uh, the tightrope that you're walking when you're trying to uh, make a drawing uh, or, or really, let's say, have a process that incorporates this kind of breadth. Um, but it is I feel like a commonality that I notice with a lot of the work that I really admire, a lot of the artists who are out there making work that I think is, is really fantastic, um, I do get this sense that there is overall a balance in between this intense uh, scrutiny of detail um, and this also sense of uh, broad and atmospheric application of value. So look for it when you're looking at artists. I think if you want to look at the work of um, a really great academic uh, called uh, Dan Thompson, um, he's someone for whom this idea of breadth is a, uh, I feel like it's a, a motto that he lives by almost. Um, and I think I, you know, I really admire that in his work that he's able to uh, to capture that, to manifest that, and kind of live in that in that world. Um, there are other artists, I think, uh, off the top of my head that that you must consider um, are incredible in this in this respect. And they're really who you who you would think that it would be, which is to say, it's kind of the usual suspects. If you look at uh, Colleen Barry's work, for instance, there's a tremendous amount of breadth. If you look at uh, Michael Klein's work, um, his paintings, uh, really, they take this spectrum of um, uh, specificity and, uh, and really interpret it out into a very interesting place, which is to say that um, if you look at the entirety of his painting, there are several areas which contain this high degree of specificity and, and other areas which um, really only speak about uh, just paint quality and, um, and the characteristics of, of color and of, of the layers of paint. Um, so in that way, there is, for me, I think, a very high degree of breadth in, uh, in work like that. Um, and these are contemporary artists, but you can consider also that uh, go to any museum that you're uh, that you're nearby. Um, you know, take a look at the work of, of Rembrandt, for instance. Um, and this is a painter who was very concerned with the big picture, um, who understood uh, as his career went by um, how much can be achieved 
when you are kind of broad and open in your work? How much of it is really, really highly detailed? By the way, of course, we have to say I'm speaking about his, his later work or his mid-career work even. Uh, his early work was very consumed in this idea of detail. But I would say that there are two things about that. One is that artists probably tend to go through these phases. I think when you're a student or when you're a recent graduate from your studies, you'll be much more concerned with kind of a high degree of detail. Um, because this is the language that you, that you know, the language that you understand. Um, and as time goes on, uh, I think artists like yourselves and, and like these artists in antiquity um, have taken a look at, at their painting world and understood that um, there is this bigger picture out there that can also be very interesting um, in addition just to that, that world of, in, of intense detail.